indulge in more than three wires. Mm -hmm. And Bob wrote a very interesting paper where we could get, I think he, if we put nine wires in there, or seven, and they had a different number of wires in there, the tolerance of the cores was less and less important. And I remember having a big argument with him, and we finally decided we wouldn't, we wouldn't stop on that plateau. We'd still fight for, for a single simple core, which is the only one really you could simply put in production. Mm -hmm. And uh, Papian argued, everybody argued, but then Dave Brown and his crew kept going at it. And as I remember it, the one that worked was a, almost alchemy. <laughs> they had these uh, cores that they had put in this furnace, and uh, the numbers may be wrong, but it was some awful, like 15,000 degrees Kelvin, is it? maybe oh, big numbers know. like that, like 1,500 probably, I don't know. But anyway, they hit them with live steam, and that gelled them. And this, those were the first ones that really did work. Then they went on from there. Are you, and, are you saying that you were making them there at Barda? Yeah. I didn't realize Well, the, no, the, the no, Whittemore no, building. No, no, we made them out in... Uh, they had a furnace in Whittemore. Must have been. I went to see it several times. Amen. Well, you're oh, skipping, no, no, no. if you want to get to some of the interesting stages, the, uh, we started, the, the Delamax was a, was a metal. It was a rolled mm -hmm. iron steel tape. Very thin, thousandth of an inch, more or less, wound up in a spiral and heat treated, and m the electrical characteristics, very sensitive to the mechanical condition and it would change if you squeezed it or dropped it or shook it <laughs> and uh, in order to protect it those first cores were individually <coughs> supported loosely inside of a plastic case mm -hmm. they were maybe an inch in diameter or so uh, and um, not all that practical really and they were slower because they were metal and had is uh, had Betty currents in them and things slower than we wanted um, the next uh, stage again was a magazine article, I think, in uh, maybe electronics that time. When uh, what's his name, Albers? Uh, well, in New Jersey, I think. In New Jersey, yeah, Albers, Schornberg, or something of that kind, yeah. had written an article on ferrite transformer cores for television sets, and his problem was that he wanted a linear low loss core, but he was having trouble getting it, and the uh, uh, the paper was about these rather fat open loop cores and what he had done to narrow them and get lower loss. So we got in touch with him and said, fine, but we want to go in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> and what could he do? At the same time, we had written to probably through North American Phillips, but we had gotten a letter. The, the ferrites, the ferrites had uh, a lot of the theoretical work. I don't know whether the initial work, but a lot of the theoretical work had been done at Phillips Eindhoven in Holland by a man named uh, Snook, S-N-O-E-K, I think it spelled. Oh, that's right. And uh, we uh, sent a communication to them asking them what could be done to get rectangular hysteresis loops in this material. The reply was that enough was known about the theory to know you couldn't do it. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, we'd had the uh, man in New Jersey look in. We haven't it. been talking to Mr. Snook. <laughs> no, we couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this gentleman, I don't know whether I ever met him or not. I didn't really deal with him personally. Papian and others did. But he was a ceramicist, by that I mean a pottery, uh, a man who had <clears throat> made ceramics in Germany and was over here and had been enlisted in the process of making television cores. The story that came back to me, and I'm especially sensitized to it having heard a lecture earlier this week about the importance of uh, or the lack of being able to transmit knowledge by the written language and explicitly, and that in a lot of areas there is, you know, the art and skill that has to be uh, transmitted. As the story came to me, anyway, from our people who went down, he would mix up a bunch of black dust and binders and things and run his hands through this mixture and say, feel square to me, <laughs> and then fire it. Well, he was, uh, you know, he was occasionally getting cores that would 
perform according to the theory and the concepts. And the first and the and the course for a long time came from him. His yield might be very low, one percent or less, I don't know. Very low yield, but it demonstrated that it was possible. Uh, we probably spent a good piece of a million dollars getting up to being able to had, uh, do as well. Hmm. But by the time we had done that, we then had traced down these 50 variables. So, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. If you look at the whole process of what you put in it, how fine you grind it, what you use for the binder, how hard you press it when you make the core, how fast you heat it up to what temperature, how fast you quench it. Uh, you know, I, you can probably tally 50 variables. Um, and some fair number of them were important. And that had to all Frank the explore. Frank played a role there, I remember. And, uh, this steam quenching, I remember clearly watching it because I didn't believe it. And I went to see it. And I, I had a feeling we had a furnace in that Whittemore building. I think we did. I did. No, we, yeah. made, we made cores. I can't remember. I'm quite sure. I'm pretty sure I know we, we made did. cores, but and the first ones came from General Ceramics. Oh, yes. The first yeah. core came from General Ceramics. And then, oh, yeah. then we enlisted Von Hippel and the Insulation Laboratory and various other people here to try to understand what was going on. And MIT and all of its science, in about one or two years, were able to match what uh, our man did by running his fingers through uh, <laughs> um, the batch of stuff. After that, of course, well, we, we were... make as many as you wanted. After, after that, of course, we were way ahead, because then you yeah, could we make... knew what, We knew what the process was, and yeah, he didn't. Yeah, you know, I mean, af after that, you know, you could turn out batches with maybe 100% yield whenever you wanted to. But the fact of the matter yeah. is that in most of science... <laughs> Not quite. Not quite 100. <laughs> we still had to test every one for well, a long time. Did. <laughs> but in, you know, in most of science, and usually, the art runs ahead of the theory. The art runs ahead of the science. People do things before they understand why. Go right back to the old tinkerers and tinners and people who would solder. They knew it to oh, how to do it sure. long before the metallurgists knew why. Oh, sure. oh, that's a fascinating. You know, it's only been very recently that the Damascus swords have apparently been reproduced. I didn't realize they had been. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've known now how to do it, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, taken all. You know, it's a lost art for. A thousand years or more. Yeah. Oh, okay. good. Well, those cores was really something because I don't. Oh, we, I don't. Know, dozens and dozens of different kinds we tested. We had even a test machine with. In fact, designing that test set was as hard as anything I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure that they were square and stay there and all that wouldn't creep and that went on. Then we had to have vibrating machines to, to invent it to put them in the racks and so oh, on. Yes. And all of that was started in that same little group in Whittemore Building because nobody else was going to do it. Oh. Did you ever deal with Pete Loon and his work on core manufacture in IBM later? Yeah, but that was a little later. Yes, yeah, quite a bit. And uh, yeah, we went through that right from Ralph Palmer, I guess, introduced me to that whole laboratory. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there's an interesting story on the patents, I suppose you'd like to hear. The, the RCA fellow came to see me. And I've forgotten his name now. He's head of the laboratory down there. Right. 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 And uh, he heard about this. Uh, this core, you know, the one wire through the middle. He says, no, that won't work. That's a transformer. You have to have a one turn through there. He said, you, you must be out of your mind. Oh, you all knew better than that. I didn't. I, I'm literally telling you what he said. And so I said, well, it's going to be a little hard on you when I take it outside to show you this <laughs> because it's already working. And then he went, came in the thing, and he said, well, no, how does it work? And I said, well, you know, flux just goes in there and hits that thing. So he's, and he went through the whole thing, and he, and he said, now he says, well, you never get any signal out without turns. There's not much flux gets into that core. So he banged it the other way, you know, poor Papian by this time he had dozens of things running. So you know, he came in my office, and he said, uh, he went all through it again. And then, he, of course, he was very interested. And he said to me, uh, I took him to lunch. And after lunch, he came to me, and he said, uh, you know, this is an institution, this was paid for by the government. He said, is there any reason why I can't patent that? And I said, well, you know, I think it's already patented. And uh, he said, well, yes, but as a university, uh, it probably hasn't been patented. And uh, so I think I'll go home and write a patent on that. Oh, my. <laughs> so I wrote a memo. That's the only contribution I made to this thing. I wrote a memo. I just was so annoyed at this after I'd paid for lunch. <laughs> so I wrote a memo to Jay saying, this, this gentleman visited me, and this is what he said. And, uh, and he 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 had he didn't think it would work, and uh, 
So it's, a, it's, it's strange. Because, yeah. As far as I know, the statement you just made was more or less known to me, but I don't know that we ever got an assertion of it in the uh, in the patent case, did we? I sent you a memo, and I and in the days of the R. J. Horn, or was that the chap? He came back to me and wanted to know did I remember anything else except what was in my memo? <clears> but this was long enough afterwards, so I just said you'll have to take my memo. I don't know what. Uh, but literally, Bob, that was the case. He literally didn't believe it would work. <laughs> Our first time I saw it. Well, the, uh, the, you <laughs> see, the, the patent case in that in that regard was very curious because the interference was with a patent of Reichman's. Reichman never took the stand, never offered any testimony, never made any depositions in it. Uh, they simply stood on a legal technicality, never made any assertion of inventorship or dates. Uh, they had a patent which was filed. The problem arose because they filed a patent before ours was actually filed. And that makes, in our case, our position so-called junior partner if uh, party if there is an interference. Reitman's patent was a very curious thing, and I have always thought with no evidence that he considered it an improvement on what we were doing. But it was a rather typical Reitman patent. It was elegant, complicated, and unworkable. <laughs> the Computron tube would be another evidence of what I mean. The Computron tube was going to be an arithmetic element in its own right, full of... Uh, full of secondary emission services and beams that went in various directions and uh, again one of these elegant pieces of logic that uh, wouldn't go anywhere and this electron tube was uh, better in the sense that some were made and they did work but uh, again were full of uh, cathode surfaces and secondary emission and uh, subject to all the problems that we were having in storage tubes actually for the same reasons mm -hmm. that uh, you had a technology there that uh, was self-contaminating <laughs> and uh, uh, a hot cathode looking at a secondary emission surface ends up boiling stuff off onto it and changing its characteristics and of course he was having that trouble there and uh, so you once uh, discussing other interesting ideas you were trying to get to for memory and delay lines. You once described the possibility of using a microwave link between Boston and Buffalo, didn't you? Yes, uh, that was an era of what you might almost call desperation <laughs> for the storage of information. And we really sat down and analyzed the possibility of renting a microwave link from Boston to Buffalo and return so that we could uh, have a high-speed delay line operating at a higher speed than uh, mercury, more stuff uh, stored in it. We, uh, you know, we never let a contract for it or <laughs> ran an experiment, but uh, it was uh, it was considered. <laughs> you remind me about Pete Loon. Um, again, he was proposing bouncing waves off the moon. <laughs> well, that would be a nice long delay line. and. Uh, it's a long wait, too. <laughs> well, it would it's have been a, a yeah, it would have been a slow. It would have been a slow. It must have been Ox memory. Was a slow <laughs> machine. <laughs> now the round trip to Buffalo was fast enough to be uh, interesting. It seems to me that maybe we, what we ought to do now is uh, give uh, Tom Taylor an opportunity to make any wind-up statements he wants to make because uh, the rest of you are going to be on another session which can go right on from this one. Very good. Very good idea. So, I think the only thing I'd like to add is I think that uh, the technical parts we've touched on probably enough. I think the atmosphere that was developed by the group in the Barter Building in the early days had as much to do with the success we had as, the, as any of the technical problems we had to solve. And it was that lack of hierarchy, that feeling that anybody could talk to anybody. Uh, I've, I've worked in a lot of places since, and uh, there's no place where if you talk to anybody and criticize what they're doing, or even ask them what they're doing, there's usually a wall goes up. What are you doing this for? You're going to steal my budget. I didn't sense any of that. Mm -hmm. And this went on for almost nine years, and right up through, through the stage computer, mm -hmm. with, without much of any of that. We tried to give the IBM fellows uh, 
that same feeling. And I think in the early days when it was a small group, that, that did exist to some extent. And I think that that was more unique uh, than anything in mm -hmm. my experience with that. It was a pleasant relationship. Yes. The fact the group stayed together for that long a time was, was unique. Uh, well, there was very little turnover in the core group. And uh, we knew we were on the threshold of technology. It was exciting. And uh, we were we came to work every morning with a lot of enthusiasm <laughs> for, for what we would we, what, what would go on that day. And uh, none of us wanted to leave. It was too interesting. <laughs> and and uh, th that, was, that was, I think, more important than, than anything. Uh, the technology was hardcore engi hard engineering. I mean, we, we weren't, uh, uh, I think we, the, the harder problems of air defense came up later. But mm. building the machine, I think, was a hard engineering. Once we had uh, some of the basic things, uh, the core was the breakthrough. That, we needed that very badly. Yes. We all knew it. Yes. So we could taste it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, we didn't mention marginal checking. That was a uh, another crutch we used. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it wasn't as easy as, as, uh, as it sounded because uh, we had to find ways of, of controlling the. This was a, a way of predicting things that might fail, and uh, one of the problems was find something that we could vary that would desensitize a circuit to a, to a marginal mm -hmm. point without killing it. And we started off with the filaments, it sounded easy, but we found out uh, the temperature varies as the fourth part of the voltage of the electron is another part. Mm -hmm. we were, we're dealing with an uncontrollable thing mm -hmm. there. And, uh, uh, and then we, uh, well, at least we learned from that to keep them stable, leave them alone. <laughs> and, uh, and then we went to the grids and then the cathodes and the, all the different variables. We tried PRF and something, we used that in the earlier days. And then we had to sectionalize the machine. You know, if you, you, it wasn't any point in, in doing the whole machine mm -hmm. once, you just you didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. So we had to make the, to make it easy, we like lower the voltage in a vertical set of digits and, and put the digits through in the opposite set so the intersection, mm -hmm. we knew which one was gone. And we had some very clever thesis people figuring out how to use it as an isolation tool and mm -hmm. automatically show what was going on. And uh, that worked uh, rather well. It worked uh, pretty well in world when we developed to a higher degree on the FSQ-7. One of the dramatic things you could do with that system was to invite somebody to go out in this room full of vacuum tubes, pull out one and bring it back. And when he got back, the computer would have typed out on the uh, typewriter where its empty socket was. <laughs> now, there were, in fact, some tubes that if that had happened, uh, if they picked the right ones, it wouldn't have worked. But uh, the odds were... The, the odds casual were, observer didn't know. The, the, the odds were good enough that he would pick one from the, the area where... It was in the rows and columns, and we were pretty good. Yeah, it was over on the end. Well, this, uh, this spirit, uh, this uh, esprit de corps that comes from solving a... Uh, hard problem is a, you know, it's something that you find other places. I was going through the Kodak plant where they make Kodachrome uh, once with uh, one of the executives and just looking at the place you knew that it had a spirit that you don't usually see in a manufacturing operation. I mean, people were interested looking, they were pleasant, they were excited, and I said, why? And he says, well, Every day that we come in here and find that we can still make Kodachrome, it's a new victory. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> well, uh, Norm, I was uh, delighted with your remarks about the Esprit and yours too. Uh, 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 about the Esprit of uh, the core of the project. And uh, it has me wanting to seek your advice and counsel on this matter. I am long overdue and much remiss in not having yet prepared a review of the book for computer reviews. And uh, a couple of reasons why I didn't slow down on it. One is I needed something like these sessions to become <laughs> uh, current on, on the project in the, in the way that we are becoming current. The second is this, that when I first talked to the authors in Probably early 1965, they visited me in here in Westchester, here in Westchester, in Westchester, and uh, I left that meeting utterly convinced that they indicated that they had been commissioned by MITRE 
to undertake this project with a view to inquiring into and reporting on the factors that made for that esprit de corps in the project. And uh, I've never really followed up on this with you or with Gus or with any of the other people who dealt with them on this project. But uh, when I accepted the commission to write the review, uh, that was one of the things that I thought I knew about the book. No, I don't think they were commissioned to do that. They were commissioned to write a book about whirlwind. And it was something that I worried about a fair amount because having been intimately involved in it, it seemed like I might be spending Miter's money to write to, well, some kind of a personal thing. Mm -hmm. So we finally persuaded ourselves that if we got a couple of professional historians and gave them a grant and said, we think this is an important thing, but you look into it, and write what you as professional historians think about it, good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, we, won't, we aren't going to publish it. It's up to you to write something good enough to get published by yourself. Mm -hmm. We thought that that was a, a reasonable way to approach it. So they re weren't really instructed to do anything. It was the historians who decided that that matter was significant. It was the historians who decided that the relationships between MIT and the Navy were significant. And I guess those of us who had commissioned the thing were surprised that there was so little in it about the technology, mm -hmm. which is, from our perspective, was so important, and from their perspective, was not. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So that was one of the things that had me saying, yes, I would, uh, I, I, I'm very interested in that issue of what counted for the spree of that project, and I can say from my own experience visiting many, many projects through that period that Whirlwind was far and away unique and very special. But there was another factor, too, in my accepting the commission, and that was that I thought I knew with utter certainty that Whirlwind had been triggered when Louis de Flores uh, found out that the reason why one of the Bell Labs simulators for a Navy aircraft wasn't working, was unstable, was that it turned out that the aircraft itself was unstable. <laughs> That sounds like an interesting observation. Was it? Did, I hadn't heard that one before. Did anybody, anybody find out whether that was true? Not secure confirmation of that from the, the special advisors people that I checked. But when I do write the review, I think I'm going to say something about both of those assumptions on my part, because I think that they are, even if they're not entirely correct. And you did offer that the authors themselves could choose the topics that they would pursue, and they did choose to pursue the issue of the esprit. Yes. So that really might be what they did say to me. I think they were meeting. more struck by it than we were, because we thought that was the way things should be. You know. <laughs> <laughs> see, I, 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 how else would you do it? <laughs> yeah, how else yeah, you see, I, don't, I don't think that I myself really thought about this or aware of it until much later when I began to realize the extent to which it doesn't <laughs> exist other places. <laughs> right. What a rarity it is. <laughs> yeah, well, I, was, I had come from the Bell System, ADS, and it was, uh, I could see the difference. I'd been in a typical large organization where people were jealous or annoyed at each other for yes. doing things differently or mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, so it was kind of a a big change. And then the idea that something new was more interesting than something old. There was no inhibition about do the, the old way because we're sure it worked. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever, ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, if it was new, it might be better. So let's give it a whirl. And, uh, and that was, that's contagious. Of course, oh, sure. and, uh, of course there, uh, were, there were contrasting organizations visible to us. The RCA laboratories always struck me as absolutely astounding for the sharp distinctions. You had a situation there where people working on the same floor wouldn't talk to each other about what they were doing until yeah. after their patents had right. been filed because their rewards and their reputations depended on the filed patents. And uh, so when RCA manufacturing wanted to build a magnetic core memory, they didn't go to the RCA labs who were contesting our patent, they came to us. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let me, let me, since we're all talking about this subject, it seems to me that, you know, there are lots of reasons. One of them is that good jobs tend to make good organizations. Yes. And this was a very good job. 
we got in at the right time. Yes. Sir. New and exciting, full of possibilities. Mm -hmm. The people were all young and unbiased by mm -hmm. previous experience. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, you know, there's a tendency in the world for people, successful programs to be ascribed to the people that run them. Mm -hmm. And they are certainly related. But it's remarkable how many times that same group doesn't seem to be able to do it again. <laughs> That's right. You give them one of those white <laughs> elephants. It never seems to get done. It doesn't work they, they, quite so They well. tend to go together. Yes. Good, attractive jobs attract good people. And you can, you had, and, we had an infinite yeah. supply of those, I think. Uh, the, uh, we yeah. did. The second, uh, Jay is a very unusual guy. Yeah. And I think his clear dedication to the job absolutely unadulterated by any <laughs> side issues, was uh, a remarkable, uh, set a remarkable atmosphere. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. And but that's the third always... thing I'd like to say, though, is that it seems to me that organizations, in my experience, go through three stages. They're usually created to do a job, and they start out job-oriented, and they start out uh, with people with common goals and enthusiasm and no internal <coughs> uh, barriers. And then they get the job done. And then you've got this organization left. <laughs> and it starts looking for things to do. So it goes into the second stage, which is the, where it's organization oriented. And almost all organizations are in that stage. Then uh, some of them do pretty well, some of them do fair. Since they mostly compete with each other in this stage, you know, you can last a long time. Uh, if they start going downhill and go far enough downhill, they reach the third stage in which the people start looking after themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is the stage before disaster. Yeah. So we were in the first stage. Yes. And other right. organizations have been in the first stage. I would guess, you know, the people who built, did Apollo, the people who did the first ICBMs, mm -hmm. the, the, the first people, people who built uh, the first nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I would guess that it was very much the same the sort of radars. Yeah. But, but after, well, after the no RCA was in the second stage, maybe even going into the third yeah. stage. The, uh, the radiation laboratory would have been yeah. pretty much yeah. the same sort of thing, or development of radar. And the instrumentation lab must have had a good bit of that flavor, too. I was on one project at the Bell System that was that way. Mm -hmm. It didn't last forever, but it was a, that was the first magnetron megawatt radar, oh. and there were about eight of us on it. Mm -hmm. And we, the Bell Labs development and the Western Electric Production were three days apart. <laughs> <laughs> we, were going into, we were going into Iwo Jima with that thing. It was a portable radar, oh, right. and we worked round the clock for eleven months, and we got one. We got a, and the aircraft was standing out in the runway to carry it out of there. Now that, that, that was a spree de corps, I have that. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, there wasn't anything else. We made a hundred of them, but that was dull after that. And, uh, but there was, uh, that was good. But centralized organizations, you know, the planned economy, the socialist organization, mm -hmm. it's remarkable that almost all organizations like that, because almost everybody thinks that he's the right level at which to run things. Mm -hmm. So they're mostly centralized, they're mostly planned economies, and those get in trouble even when they've got good jobs because mm -hmm. they will not necessarily assign the right people to them. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in the discussion oh, yeah. earlier about MIT, which is more of a free market. Yeah, I enjoyed and, that uh, remark too. You know, Jay wasn't assigned to this job because somebody thought that computers were important and they looked around and he didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I mean, Jay created this job. That's right. And I think that's important, too. And uh, I'd like to supplement what I said this morning about the visit the group made to the differential analyzer in, uh, right after the project uh, got underway, maybe as early as November 45. Could it have been that early? Excuse me, November 44. He uh, no, well, I think that, I suppose it could be, I think at the beginning is December of 44, but uh, That's what just what led, just how much was going on before that, I'm not entirely yeah. clear. Well, it was in the winter of 44, 45, in any event, that you made the visit to the differential analysis <coughs> room, and I had that uh, memorable uh, vision of a group of you arrayed around the side back of the 
of the analyzer as I was running it. What was memorable about it? I mean, uh, the, I was the, I was interested in your earlier comments, but they didn't really conjure up a picture of uh, what you remember. <laughs> well, I certainly wish I had a photograph of it. <laughs> there was just the expressions of uh, utter fascination, uh, of bright, eager uh, young men who manifest just radiated talent and uh, initiative and eagerness. <laughs> And uh, so, when, like, a year later, roughly it was, uh, when the beginning of the of the debate concerning moving from analog to digital, uh, and this is really somewhat apart from the <coughs> other issue of moving the flight simulator to the command and control, when that issue came up, uh, there was the situation where we had two analog contracts, and we had, well, three analog contracts, while you were still on an analog basis, the RES instrument, the RCA and the uh, and MIT, and um, the uh, Reeves had Rowley McCoy and two or three others that were heavy, heavy experience in analog computing. And analog computing, by my reckoning, takes a special flavor, special flair. Uh, and a flair that if you have it, you're not interested in digital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, the... Um, Digital projects are getting underway. The people who are interested in the digital projects were the IASs and the Sam Alexanders at uh, SEAC. Uh, and uh, it just was clear that they were going to build experimental setups, like uh, a lab, physics lab experimental setup. And uh, with the kind of anticipation we had of what, where the whole field was headed, that just seemed uh, a waste of time. <laughs> Would you like to hear about the stories to people who didn't like cores? <laughs> <laughs> that took a little bit of finesse, and I think we did that rather well. We had a real big display problem on our hands in, in the FSQ-7, yes. and of course the core really was designed for the FSQ-7. Yes. We back-engineered it into, into World War. Mm. And uh, the MTC was a test bed for because we knew we couldn't even talk about an FSQ-7 without a memory that it worked. But we had this tremendous display problem on our hands, and uh, we successfully convinced those people that displays were just as important as storage tubes, and they, they, they switched over. Oh, good. <laughs> and uh, that, that was a, a little bit of a... And we did, uh, you shouldn't carry away from this discussion that everything was just the Garden of Eden. I mean, mm. we did have our ups and downs. And <laughs> some of them didn't work right away, you know. And that was one where we had very important people, very good people, were essentially, we took the rug away from them. Are you talking about well, you have to, uh, you know, our people. Yeah, I mean, look yeah. at Pat Utes and Cordeman and uh, all those people. They pitched in on the Caractron and all those tubes as if that was just as important. Mm -hmm. I think that was a... In this uh, day and age when you can buy... Uh, 30,000 binary digits of storage for what, $4 or something, and they will last forever. Uh, it might be hard to put yourself back in the position before magnetic core or solid state physics when we were running whirlwind on storage tubes of our own manufacture. These tubes stored 1,000 digits uh, under ideal conditions. <laughs> uh, they cost $1,000 each to make. And they lasted about a month, and therefore we had we had storage that was costing us one dollar per month per binary digit. <laughs> those were different dollars. <laughs> yeah, those were real dollars. So uh, if you want to get an idea of the economic incentive to do something different, there it was. That's right. Well, let, let me uh, finish what I was going to say about the uh, uh, conversion from analog to digital at, uh, at MIT, as far as the SDC was concerned, and the kinds of representations I was making. He was making representations of the kind I just made about the, the wealth of experience available from the Raleigh McCoys and the art advances. But I was making representations too concerning the fresh, bright, eager, young contingent that was exactly the kind that was needed to go to work on digital. And uh, it carried weight with the Nutsons and on through the Geilers and the rest. And uh, it jives with what was said about these were young, inexperienced people, not committed one way or the other. And their commitment built up in the right direction and with the results that we've been talking about. Well, the average age of the whole group 
was under 30 in whirlwind and around 30 or so in sage, I believe. Is that right? As young as that in sage? The uh, average age of mitre when it was formed was 30. Is that right? Remarkable. When mitre was formed, which is after all that. Yeah. Right. Well, at the beginning... But, I mean, it wasn't aging very fast. Mid-45, what would you estimate the average age of the whirlwind participants to have been? In 45? Uh, Mid-45, when you're still... Well, well I'll ask Jay how old he was, because he was the old man of the group. Right, well, he was my age. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I graduated in uh, 39, so uh, in 45. Uh, no, I've been... If you're my age, you're 20, 28. 20, 27. Mm -hmm. There were a few older people like Norman here, <laughs> and, uh, like Harris von Stock. That was a little older, but he didn't. Pat Hughes. Hughes. Yeah. Pat Hughes was a very, uh, was a very interesting person. And a person whose uh, integrity I never trusted for a long time because uh, he came to us from the mathematics department as a mathematician. <laughs> and he told, no, this was not the reason. He told me how he had done statistical analysis for, Thurst, for Thurston in the early days of social science. He told me he had made vacuum tubes for the forest. He told me he'd been admitted to the Illinois bar to practice law. And I frankly and he didn't played for the Chicago Bears. Oh, he yes, played Chicago Bears, and he used to be a professional boxer. <laughs> a professional boxer. And you know, you, you lay down a certain number of these things, and you don't believe any of it. But every one that I ever had a chance yes, to sir. check turned out to be true. <laughs> <laughs> Astonishing. He was a different character. Right? Uh, he would come back Monday morning in the late 40s when it was not the thing that was ordinarily done and tell us about how he'd been flying over the North Pole with his Air Force friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you said that uh, our people who were making storage tubes were worried about the core memory. That's not true of Pat Hughes. <laughs> he was the guy who had to make these things. Well, he was worried about it because when, when he finally realized that it was the end of the road, he, he, was, he went to San Diego and he introduced him to the Characteron and then that storage tube and Rogers. You know, he was, the, he was one of the persons that I lived with after that in order to convert him over without his, and he was pretty, uh, he was pretty shaky for a while. But uh, it wasn't until after it happened that he, he wondered what he was going to do, you know. He, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I don't, he was a little old uh, for going back so to football. <laughs> To say nothing of boxing. <laughs> yeah. No, he came over to see me. We 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 had the first core memory working in MTC. Just one. And uh, Whirlwind had two banks of storage tubes. And the Cape Cod 53 system was about to go into operation. And one of Pat's characteristics that always kind of made you worry was that about once every couple of months he'd come and see me and he'd shut the office door. Tell me about how the mica mine in Canada had been shut down, or some awful thing <laughs> going on, you know. And the first few times he did that, I got worried, and after that, I just say, "Gee, that's very interesting, Pat, but I know you'll take care of it." <laughs> <laughs> but this time he was different. He came over and he said, "Bob," he said, "There are 34 tubes in the whirlwind," and he said, "We're making." What was it? five a week, about half of which worked, <laughs> and we're down to one week's supply. <laughs> and I got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> so before we ran out of storage tubes, we were able to make another core memory, and we chucked out the storage tubes and put the core memory in. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. This is a marvelous evening. <laughs> uh, it's been a great pleasure. <laughs> very appreciate it. Good to feel but if you, you haven't told us how you got into this. In other words, uh, ever since you first brought this up, I haven't quite been able to uh, explain to myself uh, why it uh, fascinates well, you. you. The story. Oh. They, we sat down with lunch with Art Singer just about a year ago, and he says that he's interested in seeing if television can be used for other than entertainment over the air, video. What are you doing? We want to do the history of the computer. So we got together. Well, why did you want to do the history of the computer? Well, that's my interest. Yeah. Yes, Richard, Richard has been 
telling me for years that he wants to write a book on the history of the computer. Mm -hmm. I have to hurry because everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. well, well, and or maybe you can write the definitive one after the others have. We, we, <laughs> I, the, fir the first attempt to get that funded uh, went about it directly. Uh, you know, just said, that. "Can we get some money for the writing the history of the computer?" Well, we didn't. Needless to say, that failed. So when uh, the, the uh, next attempt we made was. Uh, sort of back door, we, we said, uh, how about producing a TV program on the history of the computer? Well, that cost too much money. But then we ran into Art Singer, and uh, that worked. Um, my interest, of course, is uh, I've been a computer user since about uh, 1958, but, so I'm interested, but uh, is in the uh, general area of uh, social impacts of technology. I've worked on the telephone or done other things now, this is very relevant. But um, it's r really Richard's baby. Actually, what really happens is that I wanted to write a history of the Bell System, which I still want to do. And there's a lot of things out there, but they're full of holes, as people who work in the Bell System might know. And one of the things that's missing is the relationship to computers, both of them. And that's the positive and negative. And nevertheless, computers <laughs> means a lot now to the Bell System. So I went to the library. I had a Harvard library card, an MIT library card, and I could find nothing that would help me. I found a few little things about, well, this book wasn't even out then. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, Goldstein's book and Brian Randall's book, and they're not really, they're good, but they don't tell you everything. So I started digging and digging, and here we are. Well, there is, uh, do, do you know that there is soon going to be a uh, book on IBM memories? Yes, yes, I know that, because we visited uh, Charlie Bash. Yeah, I not the author. No, 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 no he, he told us what IBM. I used to think that somebody wanted to. Right. The history of the Bell system would have a frightful problem. The oh. history is piling up on you faster. <laughs> <laughs> faster than you right. yes. I cut it off in 1966 <laughs> when their troubles began. <laughs> you know, well, I read, the, I read the suggestion uh, the other day uh, that, in fact, we will soon discover that nothing has changed, that all of the uh, all of the huge enterprise broken up by the antitrust suits is being put back together by the operating companies. Uh, and <laughs> well, they're, they're going to have multi, uh, you know, uh, a uniform front for, for purchasing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then there'll be two belts. Two belts. <laughs> that, that's, that's a big change. That's like taking a snake and cutting it in half. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 The earthworm, right? <laughs> 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 they did some standard audio. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I'll be on text on Television program on von Neumann. Uh, I think I'm going to have to run well, along. Well, thank you very uh, much. Nice to see you sometime. Right. No, Maybe Richard, you're nice to see you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Yeah. I see you next time around. Has it been produced or so it's going to be produced? <laughs> well, I heard that it was going to be produced. Yeah. Uh, Rob Schlappi was going to uh -huh. You know, one of the things I'm learning, um, which I guess we always knew when you knew it, of course, but, well, people are ordinary no matter what they do. And I find that it's many... extraordinary. And they may be extraordinary people, looking? but they're ordinary people. We're all ordinary people. And that message doesn't get across in a lot of our all Well, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Carol, uh, Carol Wilson, yeah. one of our former colleagues here at MIT, member of the Club of Rome, went to uh, a meeting, I believe it was in Vienna, that Aurelio Piche, head of the Club of Rome, had managed to pull together of heads of state. Quite an impressive group, uh, not the uh, biggest countries, but uh, uh, Trudeau of Canada was there, and uh, countries, uh, you know, at that uh, level, about uh, 30 or 35 heads of state came mm -hmm. to this uh, meeting that uh, Che got together, and uh, Carol Wilson was there. When he came back, he said his overwhelming impression from having been there is that they were all ordinary people. <laughs> 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 One sometimes suspects that from reading the newspaper, but sure. often forgets it. <laughs> <laughs> what that we were that lucky, Jay. <clears throat> Everybody has like to ordinary people in charge. Yeah. Everybody has well, of course, that's one of uh, that's one of Herman Kahn's uh, themes. That it's only the uh, the middle lower class that really.